Hello and welcome to my talk about loosely or lousily coupled communication patterns in composable architectures. Happy to be here, thanks for the invitation. Um, and now enjoy the, the presentation, yeah. And before we get things actually kicked off, I quickly wanted to introduce myself as well. So my name is Thomas, I'm a developer advocate at Comunda. Um, so I do have the honor to goof around with different technologies with our product. And at Camunda, we are actually developing a workflow automation suite. So whenever you want to automate uh, maybe a workflow or two, think of us. Um, my talk might be a bit biased in one or two areas, but I'm trying to keep it, um, to keep it as straightforward as possible without um, any kinds of advertisement, right? <laughs> cool. Um, if you have any questions after my presentation, feel free to reach out via Twitter, via LinkedIn, I'm sure you can find me, or just send me a mail. Cool. Last but not least, I'm from Augsburg in Germany, so that's a nice city in Bavaria, very close to Munich. Um, yeah, so happy to be here, even though it's only remotely, but I'm sure we are going to have some fun um, and I will be there also for the Q&A session, which will take place after um, afterwards. Great. Um, yeah, let's keep things going. What are we going to, to actually discuss in this presentation? So first of all, to make things a bit more um, easy to follow, I decided to go on with a pizza um, use case. So we'll take a look on how we actually can make pizza in a scalable fashion. Next up, we'll take a look on how orchestration differs actually from choreography. So in the previous section, we'll also go over some common myth, and then we are trying to prove or um, yeah, unprove them. So last but not least, or in the last part of my talk and overall, we are having a chat about types of coupling we need to avoid, be aware of, or at least manage. So yeah, that's the agenda for today. Um, let's start off right with the with the first bullet point on our list: how to make pizza in a scalable fashion. Um, and in order to talk about food, I'm actually in my kitchen right now. I thought that's that's a very nice background for this kind of talk. Um, so yeah, and for today, the topic of choice is pizza. For sure, every one of you, once in their lifetime, um, has ordered pizza, has eaten pizza, and that's a use case we are going to take a closer look at. So, when ordering pizza, how would you typically do this? So, in Germany, um, there are basically, or there's basically one still very prominent um, way to order pizza, and that's via a simple phone call. Um, so I would go out, take my phone, um, dial a number and call the pizza place, order my pizza and ask whether it's going to be delivered or when I do need to pick up the pizza. Um, wonderful. So what do we have got there? So that's actually the first, first bullet point here, the first um, yeah, square on the left side. So we do have some synchronous blocking communication, um, but there is always this direct feedback loop because when I call the pizza place, I immediately know when to pick it up or what to expect. Um, the downside is there's still some kind of temporal coupling. So whenever I'm in the queue and you know, talking to the pizza place, no one else can reach this um, yeah, this restaurant. Um, and that's not good for, for creating a scalable um, architecture or for creating a scalable pizza place. Um, another possibility would be, for instance, to send out an email. There we are talking about some kind of asynchronous non-blocking communication without any temporal coupling. So sending an email, it will pop up at the um, at the place and I don't get any response. It's completely asynchronous. And that's a bit of a problem um, to not know when the pizza will arrive or to know whether the place has opened, to not get any kind of feedback immediately. Um, and yeah, that's just the thing we, we should be aware of at this point in time. Um, an impossibility to actually yeah, try to, to yeah, establish a feedback loop can be seen on the right side. So um, as I said, sending out an email and you'll get some kind of automatic generated confirmation or so, um, which just lets you know that your, your order has arrived and that they are going to take care about it. So you are um, 
you can be happy that the restaurant is not closed yet. Great. So um, now we can see already some synchronous, asynchronous, non-blocking communication. You can see temporal coupling, all these kind of words, which are also important for creating um, communication patterns in um, IT architectures. So another important thing I want to just highlight here is the feedback loop we have seen in the previous slide is not equal the result. So when ordering a pizza, what are we going to expect? Do we expect to get the confirmation email and then our task is done? Or do we actually expect to get a pizza delivery? And of course, the result we want to have is the pizza, not the confirmation mail. Um, so we need to bear that in mind. And that's also very important for the yeah, for the whole consideration of that example, because now we do have some kind of long running task. And a long running task can take for an hour, for instance, and in that use case. So yeah, um, let's take a closer look on synchronous blocking, um, scalable pizza making, what possibilities we do have there. And I took a nice example um, from, from the real world, um, at least what's what's here in my, my close um, yeah, neighborhood. So we do have this little kebab store on the left side, which is a perfect example for synchronous blocking communication. Within the kebab store, there's usually only one person working. They also serve pizza, and so it still fits into my pizza example. And this one person is responsible for everything. Um, and whenever you go there, you would typically order, you would pay the um, kebab, person, uh, the staff will then prepare the pizza for you, cook it, and you'll get it. And in the meantime, no one else is being able to get served or can place an order. So it's a very strict um, synchronous blocking communication. And for sure, a downside of this is that the queues pile up very easily. When we, in contrast, take a look on, for instance, Pizza Hut, they have established a way more um, efficient and scalable way of making pizza. So they have separated the order, payment and preparation. Um, and throughout this kind of separations, they apply communication patterns either of synchronous or asynchronous nature. Um, so as you can see here, in order to make things really scalable, sometimes a mixture of both communication patterns might be pretty beneficial. Over to the next slide, I try to capture what we have just seen in the pizza example in those diagrams we have seen in the first slide. So when we would only apply some asynchronous communication, something like on top would happen. Um, so we do put an order to the pizza place and there will be at a certain point a delivery return. Uh, this will take for ages. And um, as said, the most important consideration we need to take into the account is that actually we are talking about a long running task. Um, and synchronous blocking communication will also not be feasible at all. So applying a mixture of both communication styles is actually the solution as pointed out in the pizza example. So for instance, we do place an order at the pizza place, we'll immediately get some kind of synchronous feedback. Um, and then the pizza place is going to, to put the, the order into some kind of queue. The chef is then going to pick it up, prepare, cook the pizza, and then it's going to be sent over with the um, delivery person. So this is like a perfect example how you can make this thing more scalable using both principles, synchronous and asynchronous communication. And now the question would be, of course, how can we properly um, coordinate that? And that's where, um, yeah, a workflow engine comes in handy. So what we do at Kamunda, basically. And a workflow engine provides these long running capabilities and there are many, many other workflow engines. Other examples are, for instance, AWS, Step Functions, Temporal, and all these kind of um, yeah, orchestration tools do provide similar possibilities. So 
Let's take a closer look on what an engine can provide, a workflow engine can provide, just very briefly before we'll then continue. So the workflow engine does provide a scheduler definitions of workflows and it maintains the state. So the scheduler itself can, for instance, wait, retry, escalate and compensate, whereas the workflow definition just provide visibility and define the steps in some kind of sequence and some kind of process. Um, and of course, it's always beneficial to have a durable state to know um, yeah, where we currently are at, what's up next. Um, all these kind of things are sometimes quite important to, to be aware of. So given a little example right here, you can see how such kind of workflow could look like. It's still based, of course, on code. Um, so for instance, um, we do start the process with some kind of Java um, code. By a REST, we are going to trigger the, the workflow engine. When the process instance gets started, it's immediately persisted into our database, which can be seen on the right side. And our little activity we've got in there is going to call some glue code, which implements a REST call to, for instance, the credit card service in order to pay the pizza. Um, and this is simply how the workflow engine can, can orchestrate multiple things. Um, usually it uses some glue code, it steps automatically through the process, and then um, services, external services are yeah, communicated or are talked to. Cool. Um, as I said, I wanted to keep it short. Um, so I don't want to go into to way much depth in here. Um, and therefore, I guess some of you already are now thinking about, hey, that's, that's now orchestration, right? Isn't it? Um, and yeah, that's also the, the question we are trying to answer throughout the, the next part of my presentation. So orchestration doesn't couple this everything much tighter in contrast to choreography. And therefore, we need to get an understanding about how those two kind of phrases or words differ. So we need to come up with some proper definitions there. Um, to going over, let's let's take a look on command versus events-based communication because that's kind of crucial for this differentiation. When we talk about command-based communication, we usually have some kind of intent. The intent cannot be ignored. For instance, I do order this pizza margarita and then the pizza place can say, okay, got it. Um, and also very important, it is a command that's independent of the communication channel. I could use REST, I could use an, um, a message queue, so on and so forth. When we are talking about events, we are just sending over facts and the sender himself cannot control what is going to happen with that event. So it's for instance, hey, I'm hungry. And the pizza place then needs to do something with it. So you can here clearly see the differentiation between events and commands. I also want to take on, on this example right here. So um, there, back to the pizza place example, there is our chef who is going to say pizza salmon is ready. And that's a typical event, so he doesn't know, know who, for whom is this pizza, does it, or is it going to be delivered, is it going to be eaten in the restaurant, he just says, pizza salmon is ready, that's my event I'm throwing, I don't care about what's happening next with it. Whereas when talking about a command, we would rather say, this pizza is for Andrea, please package it immediately and deliver while it's hot. So that's kind of another clear differentiation example there. Going over, um, let's yeah, simply get settled on a definition. And for an event, we can say that something has happened in the past and it is a fact which happened and the sender cannot control who picks up in the or who picks up the event, right? Whereas when you talk about a command, we can always say that the sender wants something to happen, it has this intent we were talking about, and the recipient does not know who issued the command necessarily. Great. Having understood command and event-driven communication, we can over to choreography and orchestration. 
When talking about choreography, we usually make use of events. So as you can see, somebody ordered a pizza. Um, we do have our Trello card here. We can pick it down and then we can say, hey, pizza is ready. So in a choreography, we are highly relying on events. Whereas in an orchestra or within the orchestration, um, we get a very specific amount for which, uh, for which pizza to prepare for whom. Um, and that's how we can make this kind of differentiation. Exactly. So just to, to give you another quick example right here. Um, for me, I mean, I'm already in my kitchen, so I can give you also a suitable example for this. So whenever I'm cooking all by myself, um, the pan is heated up, um, the water is cooking, and all these events come in and throw are thrown within my kitchen and I somehow handle them. I only react on these events and somehow in the end I got my meal half cooked. Um, so half of it is already cold, the rest is pretty okay, um, but it's not, not a great um, the great situation overall. But whenever my lovely girlfriend is over um, and she yeah, helps me cooking, she takes the role of our orchestrator right here. And she knows exactly what to do. Um, she knows how to save me from all the events. And she can give me very lovely commands about what I need to do. So in the end, we have a very well prepared meal um, which is completely warm and very tasty. So in that role, she's taking over the role of the uh, orchestrator, she's giving me commands, and um, to just quickly drill down again, when I'm alone, there are only events popping up and I somehow managed to handle it. So <laughs> for sure, I'm working better in an orchestrated kitchen. <laughs> cool, um, yeah. Going over the, the definition quickly again is that orchestration basically uses command-driven communication whereas choreography uses event-driven communication, right? Perfect. So what's up next? Um, next up we are going to switch examples, make it a bit more difficult, having more actual services to, yeah, to get more into the technical scenario. So, we do want to talk about an order fulfillment example. We do have four microservices. One microservice is used for the checkout, another one for the payment, inventory, and shipment. So yeah, in a event-driven communication or in a choreography, we would typically send over these events. We would say, hey, order placed, payment received, goods fetched, show on its force. So what's the problem here? Um, and I've pointed this out already in the slide, so we do have an invisible event chain, which is not explicit. And especially if you grow this kind of architecture, if you add more services, if you're, for instance, having hundreds or 50 to 100 services, it gets rough to really being able to follow this kind of invisible chain. Um, because you throw events, but you don't know who consumes these events. You don't know the kind of dependencies you do have there. And changing a sequence of a step in that scenario is pretty difficult. So imagining you do want to add a new microservice between checkout and payment in order to perform some kind of age check. Um, we are, for instance, selling some alcoholic beverages next to our pizza. Um, so we need to perform some kind of age check after the person has checked out. Um, that means we would need to add a new microservice. And this microservice then needs to consume um, an event from our checkout microservice for certain events. So if alcohol was, or was purchased, a certain event needs to be thrown, then our um, yeah, HCheck microservice processes them and also throws a new event and the payment service needs to also react to these events. So even though we only add one microservice and we are expecting, hey, our architecture is quite decoupled, that's not necessarily the case because we need to change the checkout and payment microservice as well. So you see we do have 
there are already um, two other services we need to change. And so it's not as decoupled as we thought in this kind of event-driven architecture. So what I want to tell you or the thing I want to yeah, give you on your way is that only using choreographies and, or choreography and events uh, might lead to some severe problems, especially if you are grow, if you are growing. Um, so there is a nice, nice picture on the right side from QCon. I think it was still 2019, um, and they were actually mentioning, "Hey, we do suffer from a pinball mesh in architecture. We've got no clue what's going on." And there are so many resources currently about this whole problem. Um, also from Martin Fowler, for instance, um, that, yeah, I think we are all aware of that. So how could we tackle this? Can orchestration actually help to solve this downside from choreography or is a mixture the best? To, to do so, um, I, I did a little um, example right here so we can mix up both things, um, the best of both worlds, more or less. We can, because we can always mix events and commands. For instance, the checkout throws an events or throws an event, hey, my orders place. Um, then we do have another um, central microservice. So there's one which has been added here, which is the order fulfillment, which does the role of some kind of orchestrator. And our order fulfillment service then can send a command to the payment microservice and the payment a Microsoft once again so that was the payment received command and so on and so forth. So we always, or our microservices always throw some kind of events and we do have some kind of orchestration tool who triggers microservices um, by sending over commands, which do have the intent we are talking about. So it's also, I think, a good key takeaway for you to remember that those two communication patterns or that those choreography and orchestration can be very well mixed together and um, you don't need to decide for one thing. So the collaboration style is very independent from the communication style is another very important takeaway as well. So whenever you reuse, for instance, um, orchestration uh, or whenever we use a command or an event, we can either way rely on an asynchronous or synchronous communication. Um, for instance, when, when sending over the payment received command from the order fulfillment service to the payment service, we can make use of some asynchronous blocking communication, or we can send it as a synchronous blocking one. So um, whether we use events or commands, we can, yeah, we can keep it decoupled from the collaboration style, actually. Uh, communication style, sorry. Yeah, cool. So, Let's go over to another little example which shows a real-life mixture of orchestration and choreography in some kind of process-driven world. So we do have the workflow um, captured in this kind of notation for capturing them, so they're standardized. And in this example, we make use also of custom onboarding. So in this custom onboarding process, we start off the process, we run through a few, a few, yeah, um, activities there. So we want to, for instance, check the address, we want to um, do a credit check, and in order to do so, we are relying on orchestration, as pointed out in there. Um, so we send over something, we send over a command, we get a response, so on and so forth, um, because that's crucial for continuing the overall process, and that's in the scope of the custom onboarding. But later on, we do have a very good example for choreography because we want to you know, enroll the customer who just signed up um, for, for instance, loyalty points or for um, a notification service. And that's a very good example to use choreography for because we are triggering maybe processes, we are triggering other systems, but we are not waiting for any kind of response. We are just saying, hey, um, there's something for you, loyalty point service, go on and enroll that person. Um, here is the, the event I'm sending over. But we are out of the scope of our custom onboarding process afterwards. And usually that works pretty well, um, making use of, of this kind of example or this kind of technique there. Great. So let's sum things up about the communication options we do have. 
So we do have our communication style, which is either synchronous blocking and asynchronous non-blocking. We do have the different collaboration style, either event or command driven. Um, there are certain examples out there, for instance, for uh, command driven synchronous blocking communication, we could use REST. Um, message queues or for event asynchronous non-blocking communication, there are those common messaging topics. Um, feedback loops, HTTP response or some kind of response message in a message queue. And of course, those phone call, email, Twitter examples from the pizza ordering um, use case we've talked about. Cool. Um, as promised, next up, I quickly wanted to talk to you about um, yeah, coupling in general. So I differentiate between four types of coupling. So first of all, there's a implementation coupling, which does cure when, for instance, one service does know the internals of another service, say, for instance, a joint database. And that's for sure, I guess that's very clear. Always try to avoid this, <laughs> right? Um, but we also can um, chat about temporal coupling, where a service depends on the availability of another service. And um, synchronous blocking communication is one of these problems. And we should be at least aware of this. So we need to, we should try to reduce this because it's, it's kind of a bad practice, but sometimes you get, don't get around of it. Um, so you need just be aware of it, manage it, try to reduce it as far as possible. Um, Last but not least, there's deployment coupling, um, where multiple service, multiple services can only be deployed together. Um, the example is the release train, and um, yeah, I would always encourage you to avoid this. I've been working in a product which was within a release train, and it's been always a very, very big mess. So for sure, that's not a recommendation to use any of this. And last but not least, most importantly, domain coupling. Um, and domain coupling occurs always. It's unavoidable unless you change the business requirements or server bound, service boundaries. So you always need to take into account um, business capabilities which can change or which require multiple services. Um, for instance, the order fulfillment uh, microservice I mentioned which is in need of another H-check microservice because the business requires it. And such kind of things are simply unavoidable. You always have them and you need to be aware of them. Um, those systems are still coupled together. They are not completely independent, even though you've tried to use a very decoupled microservice architecture. Right, cool. Um, with having said so, we are already at the summary of my um, my short talk here. So I think good to know is that um, you are now aware of the communication styles and the collaboration style, as well as the collaboration style being independent from the communication style. So these are um, most importantly the things you should need to be aware of. And you also um, can add to this kind of you should know section that you now are well aware of um, how to use or that you are able to mix choreography and orchestration and that this is usually a good way how to achieve or how to create a more scalable or more composable architecture. Yeah, um, talking about temporal coupling with asynchronous communication, make sure that um, your team can handle it, that, it, that people are well aware of what this, yeah, um, that's going to, to do. Um, if you do need long-running capabilities, might make sure you do have them. And sometimes synchronous communication and the right patterns are also okay. So there are some yeah, very prominent synchronous uh, communication patterns like the circuit breaker, which can also be used if you want. But most importantly, domain coupling will never go away and you should always be aware that that persists. Cool. Thank you so much for listening. Um, I hope you aren't asleep yet. If you want to take a look on an example, you can, for instance, check out this uh, attached repository, which shows how Kamunda orchestrate um, a flowing retail use case, also using Apache Kafka as a uh, message queue. So yeah, let me know what you thought. Now I'm happy to, to take your questions. And thanks again for having me here. It was a pleasure speaking.
Hey, Bye. thanks so much for watching. I really hope you got some value from that. And by the way, if you want more where that came from, we want to invite you to be a part of our community. Uh-huh. Go to composability.dev and register today. If you've already registered, you know what I'm talking about. And by the way, if you're on Twitter at all, go to JavaScript Jam and follow us. Why? Because every Wednesday at 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, we go live. Yeah, live on Twitter Spaces. And you can join us and be with us there while we're live. Heck yeah. You know what? And it doesn't matter if you're a beginner or you've been doing this forever. We love everybody being involved. We bring so many people up to the stage. We have so many great conversations. We want you to be a part of it. All right. We'll see you there.